This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. The world is struggling to feed itself. But a mission unprecedented in human history is being accomplished in China as it feeds 20% of the global population with only 9% of the world's cultivated land. What's the secret behind China's successful establishment of food security? The very strong political commitment with the hard work of the Chinese people itself. Food self-sufficiency is not China's only goal. So the whole system must be transformed. They need a better nutrition, better health, better environment. As a worldwide crisis looms, what contributions can China make to global food security? Global collaborations, integrations, co-governance from all sectors keep key supply chains moving. Join us this week to explore how China is modernizing its agriculture sector and building a resilient future. Only on BizTalk, only on CGTN. Welcome to this edition of BizTalk. I'm Guan Xing in Beijing. Today, we'll focus on China's efforts to modernize its agriculture sector. Meanwhile, as global food security is at a critical moment, what contributions can be made by China to overcome the pressing challenges? To help us better understand these issues, we're joined by three distinguished guests today. Carlos Watson, the representative of the UN Food and Agriculture Organization in China. Welcome to the show, Mr. Watson. And Fan Shengen, Chair Professor of China Agriculture University. Always a pleasure to see you, Professor Fan. And Jerry Chen, head of Louis Dreyfus Company, North Asia. Thank you for your time today, Mr. Chen. China feeds 20% of the world's population with only 9% of the world's arable land. China's grain output accounts for roughly one quarter of the global output. In 2012, the average grain output per capita was 452 kilograms. It has since risen to 474 kilograms. With 70 years of continuous harvest, China's massive food supply system is in a never-ending cycle. But China has succeeded in feeding one-fifth of the world's population with less than 10% of global arable land. But China's latest five-year plan has a food security agenda for the first time. So is China's food security still an enormous challenge, Mr. Watson? As uh, the Chinese saying goes, that food is a is permanent necessity. This also means that food security has been given the utmost importance in China. Uh, issues related to agricultural, rural development, and farmers' livelihoods are on the top of the government uh, work agenda in China. 19 years in a row, the annual number one document issued by the central government has cast focus on sustainable agricultural development and food security, indicating the very strong political commitment in this regard. And of course, uh, this all this combined uh, with the hard work of the Chinese people itself um, has made uh, that China accomplish food security achievements that we are witnessing today. This represents the strong consistency and coherence of the Chinese policy making when it comes to fighting against uh, hunger and safe safeguarding food security. China has set the world a remarkable example in the pursuit of SDG 1 and SDG 2 zero poverty and zero hunger, respectively. Yet, food security is not something that we can achieve once and for all. By definition, food security exists only when all people at all times have physical and economic access to sufficient, safe and nutritious food that could meet the dietary needs, food preference, to live an active and healthy life. It is an everlasting goal that we should strive at all times in all the four dimensions for food security, food availability, food access, food utilization, and food stability. The achievements reach in the fight against poverty and hunger become durable and permanent in development uh, words, sustainable. 
with this rural revitalization strategy. And Professor Fan, what is your view on China's food security? Are you seeing some renewed challenges due to the COVID-19 outbreaks and natural disasters? Yeah, well, it is absolutely right that China has ended hunger. Mm -hmm. Because by 2020, Chinese government declared that China has already ended poverty. You also end hunger. Right. Now, I think the uh, in addition to that, the Chinese diet have also changed quite a bit, you know, from uh, majority of stable foods to more balanced, more diverse diets. Uh, on the other hand, Chinese food and nutrition security face some new challenges. One is obviously declining natural resources. Water, land are becoming very limited. Climate change is also affecting our food systems. Then the nutrition side, yeah, I think the nutrition also includes adequate micronutrients, for example, vitamin A, zinc, and iron. I think Chinese population still, some of the population still lack adequate micronutrients. And even more importantly, the overweight obesity have been increasing. So in 2020, the overweight and obesity rate in China for, for the adult population is over 50%. So you can see the Chinese food system is, is facing challenges in both environmental sustainability, including climate change, and nutrition. We must use a food system approach, or agriculture food systems, and the whole chain, including their impact on environment and health. So the whole system must be transformed to deliver better nutrition, better health, better environment, and help to mitigate the climate change. So that's why in the latest five-year plan, the food security still is a priority. But this mm. food security is very different from previous one. And Mr. Chen, China is a crucial link in the global food supply chains. From your observation, how does China respond to the global food crisis while ensuring its harvest and stable food supply chains? So in my eye, there are enough food global-wise. For example, there are enough uh, uh, agricultural commodity nowadays in the Black Sea in Brazil. There is food there, but the thing is because of uh, all the uh, turbulence impact to the global trade and as well as the allocation unequal. So that created so-called the global food crisis in certain extent. The way in my eye to solve the issue is uh, global collaborations, integrations and uh, co-governance from all sectors so that the food and the knowledge can be shared towards our common goals to keep key supply chains moving safe uh, reliable and uh, responsibilities from uh, farmers to end the consumers. Coming up next, China is striving to promote sustainable agriculture. However, should sustainability take backseat compared to food security? We must promote the synergies, win on yield, win on farmers' income, and a win on environment. Agriculture's long established industry, how can it be improved? Promote science and technology innovation in agriculture is a rural revitalization. Three hundred sixty degree profiles of industry movers and shakers, tech mavericks, and policymakers. We drill down on their success. We ask how they set strategy and how they navigate in an increasingly competitive market. Real talk, real business. Join the conversation. Biz Talk, only on CGTN. China proposes smart agriculture as a main direction for high-quality development of agriculture and rural informatization in its 14th five-year plan. By promoting smart agriculture through the use of the Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, robots, and drones, rural development is strengthened. And while the plan proposes for smart agriculture to achieve an ambitious new milestone by 2025, the informatization rate of agriculture production will reach 27%. But there is still a lot of work to be done in order to achieve that goal. Uh, Mr. Watson, what are your suggestions on how to achieve that goal? 
experts predict that uh, by 2050, probably the world population will, will double. So that means that we have to be uh, really creative on how to produce uh, more with less. You know, the, the natural resources, especially land, all the land, water, uh, are not going to increase. Probably they're going to, 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 to decrease. So one of the main components of this increase of food, uh, of food for the, to feed the world in the coming years is, is innovation. Is the innovation in all the areas? I mean, this is not only technological, but even even now, uh, even things like best practices, uh, technology, etc. So again, in the recent uh, release, the 14-5-year plan, the government is clearly set out to the benches to promote science and technology innovation in agriculture to pro promote this uh, rural revitalization. I believe that this is a great opportunity for China to transform the agri-food systems and also an excellent opportunity for us to partner with China in the agricultural high-tech innovation development processes. China's agricultural practices have undergone numerous transformations over the centuries, from the use of crude tools to the integration of advanced machinery and technologies. China's agricultural technology contribution rate has increased from 20% in 1949 to 60% in 2021. China is the world's leading producer of vegetables, fruits, poultry, fishery products, cotton, eggs, cereals, and meat. Uh, Professor Fan, in your opinion, how far is China away from modernization of its agricultural industry? Yeah, no, clearly China has one of the largest agricultural research systems in the world in terms of agricultural research spending and also in terms of number of scientists, so there's no doubt. But to make the Chinese innovation system, agricultural innovation system, even better to become modernized. I think there are several ways to do. So number one is to increase agricultural research investment. Right now, the agricultural research investment in China is about maybe 0.6 to 0.7% of agricultural GDP. For developing countries, like the United States or European countries, they spend 2%. Number two, it also depends on where to spend. I think in the past, the money has been spent on high yielding. But in the meantime, we should also include nutrition, enhancing nutrition of these crops, these foods, and to build the resilience. And also, I think the, um, some of the modern technologies in processing, for example, the future, future food, future meat, the smallholder farmers must adopt these technologies, modern technologies. And Mr. Chen, what is your view on China's modern agriculture and high-tech development? Is the private sector seeing opportunities? The innovation and the, the, the two carbon initiatives in, in China offers a lot of interesting opportunities in the agricultural sectors we are in. So uh, I will make two examples. One is the, the green electricity. It offers us have the opportunity uh, opportunities to uh, lock, lock in the long-term electricity price in a more green and a more uh, efficient way. Uh, the other example is on the uh, uh, dairy farming sectors. And we found that uh, for our customers, they also pay a lot of attention on the reduction of uh, uh, gas emission. Uh, Mr. Watson, in your opinion, how important is promoting green and sustainable uh, farming to China? In the current format, the present uh, food systems are not sustainable. We must act now. Despite the remarkable development in agricultural sector in China over the past years, the country still faces a series of challenges in promoting green agriculture and sustainable agricultural development. Green technology integration and green agricultural product supplies are still insufficient and need to be further enhanced. I notice the Chinese government is uh, taking important steps in addressing all these challenges. The Ministry of, of Agriculture and Rural Affairs, together with five other land ministries, jointly issued the Green Agricultural Development Plan 2021 to 2025, I believe, putting forward concrete development targets and intervention measures for green agricultural development in this country. And Professor Fan, what is your view on promoting sustainable agriculture in China? And also you mentioned small-scale farmers in China. Is it a challenge to improve their awareness of sustainability? Well, actually, Chinese farmers have been practicing sustainable agriculture for a long time. 
mm-hmm. by recycling animal manures and human waste. Right. You know, we have been doing that for ages, but it's just a, for the last uh, several decades because of the the pressure to increase more production. So the China used fertilizer, pesticides, but Chinese government has introduced new policies as a, to stop that. For example, in 2015, China introduced so-called zero in our chemical fertilizer use to encourage the farmers to use organic fertilizers. So I think the the regenerative agriculture or sustainable agriculture are being considered as a way to improve food production on the one hand and to protect our, our environment on the other. And equally important is to help to mitigate the climate change. So how can we redesign certain policies, for example, some of the subsidy policies uh, can be repurposed to support more greener, sustainable, regenerative agriculture. So yes, the trend is there, but more needs to be done. I think now we must promote the synergies, win-win, win on yield, win on farmer's income, and a win on environment, win on climate change. Coming up next, will food protectionism gain traction? No countries should use export bans to protect their own domestic market. Can Chinese experience also help developing countries? Bring the new technologies, new business models, as well as the new investment to the developing countries. The world economy as we know it is about to change. Global business reports highlight emerging markets, developing countries, and dynamic sectors worldwide. We feature top analysts and newsmakers to provide perspectives on every facet of business. From an on-the-ground perspective, we provide you with balanced and objective assessments. Fast, sharp, and insightful. Global Business, only on CGTN. Now, let's talk more about the imminent threat facing global food system. Mr. Watson, the FAO has repeatedly warned of the scale and severity of the crisis. Uh, could you tell us where we are now right now and what urgent actions are needed? Today, we are actually falling and we are way off track today. If trends continue like this, without decisive actions and interactions, the numbers by 2030 would have fallen to the levels of 2015 or even below. According to the state of food security and nutrition in the world, the SOFI report 2022 is estimated that 800 million people are affected by hunger in 2021 from severe to, uh, to moderate levels. It is projected that 670 million people uh, will still be undernourished in 2030. That's uh, 8% of the world population. And just to mention a, a, a few examples, you know, globally, a third of the soils are already degraded. What is urgently needed is a transformation to one more sustainable agri-food systems like we have repeatedly, the three of us mentioned. So we have to work on these partnerships to, to, to make sure that we arrive uh, to a happy conclusion of the 2030 agenda. Droughts, floods, wildfires, and heat waves have become more severe and frequent. It's getting harder and harder to ignore the disasters being caused by global warming and how it's posing threats to global food security. China has to face this as well. Nearly 100,000 hectares of crops were damaged by historic flooding in southern China in June followed by continuous hot weather in the southern part of the country since July, reaching a high of 40 degrees Celsius. Heat waves have dried up part of China's crops and are making grain harvesting difficult this autumn. A number of measures have been taken by the Chinese government to mitigate harvest damage. How will China ensure that there is enough food? And Professor Fan, what is your view on this? And how is China adapting to this crisis? Because of the heat waves, we have seen the heat waves in Europe, heat waves here in China, heat waves in India, now recent floods in Pakistan. So this year, we're actually going to see a decline in food production globally. Wheat production, maize production probably will go down. Even from the supply side, 
we are very tight. And another issue is all the supply are not well distributed for the people still lack of food. Mm. Now, this on the production side, we are having problem. On the demand side, the consumption side, because of, of the increased food prices, and also because of reduced income, because slowing down economy and the COVID-19, so many people simply cannot afford food because of higher prices, and many cannot afford healthy and nutritious foods, fruits, vegetables, dairy products, meat, seafood, and so on. So prices is here already. But here for China, China is a different story because of the government policy. So rice, wheat are self-sufficient. There's no doubt that you know, adequate stock and the production has been pretty good. The, uh, the wheat, spring wheat had a bumper crop. And uh, I think the, uh, the rice is also going to have a pretty good harvest. So the major food stables are not, not a problem. But in the future, we must prevent potential crisis, particularly from imports. The, uh, right now, it seems to me the import sources are very stable, are secured, but China needs to make sure that that imports will continue to happen. And maybe China could diversify imports by working, working with African, Latin Americans, and the South Asian to diversify import sources. So Chinese imports will become more resilient, more reliable. And Mr. Chen, uh, Mr. Watson just mentioned that it's important to involve the uh, private sector for a stronger partnership. Uh, what do you see the impact on the private sector and how are businesses coping with these challenges such as trade disruptions? So as a global uh, green merchant, I'm a little bit optimistic uh, regarding on the food crisis issues. So on one hand, uh, we do see that uh, price moving uh, higher. But on the other hand, the high price also is give a strong incentive for the farmers global wise to produce more pr uh, products. So uh, according to the estimations of next year, the, the farmers in Brazil pro probably is going to uh, produce the record high soybean uh, productions more than 155 million metric ton. This is uh, one of the historical uh, in the world as an example. Demand wise, we, we see uh, people start to uh, learn how to more efficiently uh, use this uh, nutrition and raw material and by uh, embracing more new uh, innovations, technologies. There are plenty of uh, uh, stock, but uh, uh, the distribution is, is unequal. So as long as there are free trade there, we do believe via this uh, free trade, we are able to solve the, the full shortage in the uh, uh, deficit uh, region by shipping the, the this uh, agricultural product from the uh, surplus regions. So we believe open and win-win international economy and uh, trade uh, cooperation remains the trend for the global development and the key to create 18 shared, fair and a sustainable value. A wave of protectionist measures enacted by food exporting countries has given further impetus to soaring global prices, aggravating poverty and instability. Governments have resorted to protectionism by curbing exports in order to protect their domestic food supplies from rising prices. Indonesia banned palm oil exports in April, while India restricted sugar exports and banned wheat shipment in May. Green exports have also been temporarily restricted in Serbia, Hungary and Kazakhstan. Restrictions on food shipments can damage a country's trade reputation and hurt local farmers under high prices. Mr. Watson, what more can be done in international cooperation in the agriculture sector? Uh, do you see challenges of rising protectionism or even nationalism? Increased, increased trade in agriculture, fisheries and forestry products is an essential component of most countries' development strategies. Global trade and well-functioning markets lie at the heart of the development process and try and they can spur inclusive economic growth and sustainable development and strengthen uh, the resilience to shocks. We need to rely on markets as an integral part of the global food system to maximize uh, the positive impact on trade and food security. We need uh, good policies that are necessary to create an environment that enables markets to flourish. We strongly call on governments to recognize the importance of ensuring that trade, whether internal or international, remains open and frictionless as much as possible, free from restrictions and 
and needs a food capacity in terms of volumes and from feeding. Professor Van, what is your views and comments on this? And uh, what role can China play in international cooperation? Yeah, I think four areas. Number one is the trade, the open, fair, transparent trade will be so critical to feed the world sustainably and healthily. Here, particularly, no countries should use export ban to protect their own domestic market. We have seen many, many times the countries use export bans to drive the global food prices very high. Right. Don't do that. Stop doing that. And China, what is the China role there? China should work with the G20 countries, with the United Nations, like FAO, WFP. Number two, is technology transfer. So here in China, lots of technologies, yield enhancing technologies, nutrition enhancing technologies, and you know, the resistance to pests, to droughts, to floods technologies can be shared with Africans, with Latin Americans, with South Asians. So these countries can produce more and globally we have more food available at the international market. So number three, is foreign direct investment. You know, Chinese companies are investing in many other countries. Investment can help the local farmers produce more access to markets. The last one, or number four, is the global governance. You know, FAO, WFP, are some of the global agencies, institutions. I think this agency needed to have a better coordination, better system to work together. I think China be, could be part of that voice. And I, I think here in particular, China can train more people so they can be part of the UN system to make sure that China can contribute to the global food system governance. China is in the media spotlight once again, with Western countries playing the blame game amid the global food crisis. U.S. officials singled out China for stockpiling fertilizer and grain while millions of people in East Africa face starvation. However, is China really at fault? Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson Wang Wenbin said China can ensure a domestic grain supply for its people and there is no need to stockpile food from international markets. Over the past decade, China's grain production has steadily increased even amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. In fact, China has contributed positively to global food security through a variety of projects. The country has donated the most funds, sent the most experts, and undertaken the most projects under the framework of the FAO South-South Cooperation Program among all developing countries. And Mr. Chen, China has been very active in sharing its knowledge. In your opinion, can China's experience also help developing countries to cope with their food crisis? For sure. So from a uh, company's angle, so in my eye, uh, at least we have three things uh, as we as company we can do to helping the de other developing countries to deal with the food supply uh, uh, issues. So the first one is the technology side. There are a lot of uh, innovation happening in China. The high efficiency uh, usage uh, uh, of those uh, raw materials can be one of the example. So in China, the innovation nowadays not only happening in the technology side, but also on the business model side. So we have some very interesting business models that uh, uh, in cope with the, the very unique development stage of the developing countries. Nowadays, there are a lot of uh, Chinese agricultural companies become the world leading, leading companies. We are very uh, glad to help to all work together with them to, to, to go abroad and uh, bring the new technologies, new uh, uh, business models, as well as the new investment to the developing countries to help uh, we all can achieve a more healthy, affordable, sustainable uh, uh, world. Well, thank you very much. And that's all the time we have for today. And many thanks to all of you for sharing with us. Carlos Wilson, the representative of the UN Food and Agriculture Organization in China, and Fan Shengun, Chair Professor of China Agriculture University, and Jared Di Chen, head of Louis Dreyfus Company in North Asia. And that's all for this edition of Biz Talk. Thank you for being with us. Until next time, bye for now.